Hello and welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Today on the table, I have a really cool historic light machine gun that comes out of Italy and is really popularly known for having served in the Italian Armed Forces in the Second World War. This video is going to be a historical and technical overview of this firearm. We're not going to do any shooting in this video, but I might do a video like that at a later date. But I wanted to go over the historical relevancy of this as an Italian small arm, its development, and of course, take a technical look at how it functions and operates. If that sounds interesting to you, please stick around, it's coming up now. Okay, so taking a look at the Breda Model 30, if we really start back with the company Breda itself, it had humble beginnings dealing in the locomotives industry prior to the First World War. They had a lot of really skilled engineers, technicians, machinists who could make these finely tuned and milled and machined parts for the locomotives industry. Now, when the First World War would kick off, this would be true in Italy as well as every other country around the world. There's examples of this in the United States in the Second World War specifically, where you have jukebox manufacturers, uh, sewing machine manufacturers, uh, automotive manufacturers getting roped into the war effort. This was true in Germany, this was true in Japan, and this is of course also true in Italy when the First World War would kick off. Now, Breda would be roped into the war effort to help Fiat, which was manufacturing the Fiat Ravelli 1917 heavy, it's Maxim derived heavy, uh, water-cooled, belt-fed machine gun. The armaments in the Italian military in the First World War really centralized around the stationary heavy machine gun being supported by light infantry with their Carcano rifles. There wasn't really in any type of employed light machine gun role at the time. You did have things like the Villa Perosa, which was a modified aircraft firearm. You had things like the SIA 1918, which was a quasi, I guess, somewhat maneuverable uh, variation of their in their machine gun, but there was really no light machine gun roll or light support weapon that could be easily maneuverable with the squad as it was advancing. Now, technology in this regard was actually, there was somewhat of an arms revolution happening around the world. We talked about this when we looked at our Japanese Type 11 video uh, several months ago, but Japan was coming into this fold with the squad automatic or light machine gun with the Type 11. You have uh, Great Britain with the Lewis gun. You have uh, uh, the Danish Madsen. You have the American 1918 BAR. You have through the 1920s, uh, France with the Chatellerot light machine guns. You didn't really have anything that would fit this type of support role in the First World War. Now, the war would come to an end, and just like every other country in the interwar period through the 1920s, Italy would want to revamp their armament. So, Breda, who had been spending you know several years during the First World War learning on how manufacturing of uh, military armaments, war materiel, was working, getting experience in building and manufacturing firearms, wanted to come up with a new weapon system that would fit the light support role within the Italian military. Now, two engineers at Breda, one is Cesare Sonaccini, and the other is Battario Catelli. <laughs> I don't know, I'm totally mispronounced, but I got the hand gesture, so give me a little bit of a, a room there on that one. Uh, they came up with a variation of a light machine gun called the C5, which was later the Tipo 24, which became the Modelo 24, which got evolved through the 1920s into what was actually officially adopted by the Italian Armed Forces as the Breda Model 30. Now, what you see before you is essentially the light automatic weapon. It was chambered in 6.5 Carcano, um, and which was the standard issue uh, cartridge at the time. There were different variations of this. So there was the Ital I'm sorry, there was the uh, the Breda Model 35, which was adopted for Costa Rican contract, which actually is what we have here. And then there was a variation manufactured in 735 Carcano, um, which prior to the onset of the First World War, Italy was looking at changing from the 6.5 to the 7.35, as the 6.5 was deemed to be a little bit anemic. Similar thing was happening in Japan with the 6.5 to the 7.7. By the time the war had spurred up, they had to kind of scrap that idea and go back to a lot of their 6.5 armaments that they had stockpiled. So you had this weird mix of 7.35 and 6.5 armaments. The same was true in the Breda. There was this, they existed in the two calibers, but the 7.35 was way more rare and harder to come by, at least today. But it was basically meant to be carried by one person within the rifle uh, group. You would have one of these issued to a rifle group. You would have about 24 to 27 uh, issued at the battalion level. And it was actually really meant to be the backbone of the squad, uh, you know, supported by Carcano rifles again. 
Now, Italy had moved into a new heavy machine gun, the, the uh, Model 37, and that, that as well as the submachine guns that were being produced by Beretta were not built in sufficient numbers to make that big of a difference. Really, one of the game changers, although it's somewhat of a dog of a machine gun, uh, was the Beretta Model 30 being employed with the riflemen in support, who were all personally trained on the use of the Breda machine gun, specifically in reloading. Now between 1930 and 1945, about 30,000 of these would be produced and it would first get its baptism by fire in the Italo-Abyssinian War of 1935-1936 with the invasion of Ethiopia. Now where this is most popularly known for having served was in the North African campaign in the Second World War, which is where it got a lot of its distinction for being a pretty bad machine gun. There was a, quite a few reasons for this. First of all, you did have a feeding system of a somewhat fixed magazine here on the right hand side of the firearm. The assistant gunner could open this magazine, which would hinge over uh, right off here to the right hand side, and then charge it with a 20 round stripper clip, would then close the machine gun, charge the, uh, charge the machine gun, it did fire from the closed bolt, and then commence firing. Now, being that it is a closed bolt, this is a locked breech short recoil action. It did have a lot of problems with cook-offs because when you have a closed bolt machine gun, you do have a typical issue with heat. They did employ a quick change barrel system with a little lever on the left-hand side that could be thrown down and the barrel removed for quick changing. Because of the closed bolt nature, uh, this was actually intended to have a barrel change about every 250 rounds. Also being a closed bolt lock breech machine gun, it did have a slow cyclic rate of about four to 500 rounds per minute which actually combined with its necessity to be reloaded after 20 rounds, led it to be a very, very slow rate of fire. So again, you had everybody in the rifle unit was trained on how to quickly reload the firearm because quick magazine reloading was essential to keeping this thing running at a relatively reasonable combat rate of fire for support purposes. Um, there were positions where this would be used mounted on armor and things like that where it was not actually easy to reload and in those sort of circumstances it was not really that effective of a machine gun beyond a typical you know rifle fire or anything like that. Now there were a lot of openings in the machine gun as well. On top of the magazine there was a window that the support gunner could look through to see how much ammunition was left. This was a uh, design flaw in the French show shot as well so they should have really taken notes from that. So this would lead to a lot of grime and dust especially in African, you know, sandy conditions. On the left-hand side, you did have a feed port with a dust cover that would close, but unless you wanted to, you know, keep keep it closed, but you keep dirt and grime and the elements out of the machine gun, the problem is, is when you employed it into combat, you had to remember to open that dust cover because if you didn't, you could get ca catastrophic failures as you couldn't eject spent casings out of the firearm. Additionally, this one does not have it because this is a Costa Rican contract. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, you would have an oiler right up here at the top, which would be filled with a high viscosity oil to lubricate rounds as they were being fed. It did have very violent early extraction, uh, which could cause to case head separation and things like that. So the, the uh, necessity for oil uh, was vital to keep this thing running, but oil, when it builds up inside the action, does become a magnet for dust and grime and debris as well. That coupled with a lot of large openings into the receiver of the firearm could also lead to pretty severe stoppages. Now the Costa Rican firearm on the seven millimeter Mauser did not have necessity for an oiler. That's why there's none on this top cover. This is a Costa Rican contract model 1935. Uh, this one particularly is serial number 39. Uh, all the Costa Rican contract number of guns I have seen have been one to two digits. So I think probably only a few hundred were manufactured for Costa Rica, making this a, a pretty rare firearm. At the same time, uh, Breda had been manufacturing a automatic rifle for uh, Costa Rica as well around the same time, 1935. Uh, actually, Germany as well was an early adopter of this prior to their uh, involvement with the MG34. It was the MG099i, I believe, and um, Germany had taken advantage of that as part of their rearmament going back into, you know, rebuilding their armaments prior to, you know, again, their adoption of the 34, the 42, and all the other uh, weapons that they had come up with. But again, this did see early German service as well. So that basically sums up the historical overview. Let's go ahead and bring in the camera close and take a look at the technical aspects and the function of this firearm. Okay, so bringing in the Breda Model 34 close, um, for a close up here, let's talk about function and disassembly. First of all, to load the firearm, you would bring, you would push on this button here on the magazine, and you would bring it over and it would lock here to the side. 
Now, the assistant gunner would then take a charger strip loaded with 20 rounds and push it into the magazine. Once loaded, turn it over and it would lock in place. Now, you can remove the magazine off of the firearm and replace it with others if this were to get damaged. If this hinge point were to break, uh, that could uh, render the firearm inoperable as this was not really meant to be a replaceable magazine. Again, you're loading it with stripper clips as you continue to fire. As you see right up here at the top is this big open uh, sort of window so that the assistant gunner could tell how many rounds were still loaded into the firearm. This was a really good opportunity for dust debris and that sort of stuff to get into the action and into the firearms as they're loading into the receiver. Now, if we open up the top cover here, you're going to see, and I'll actually zoom this in close for you. Here is the top of the bolt and there is this nut right here. This is a furniture nut in this H block, this sort of assisted wedge, it sort of cams the furniture, uh, furniture block from left to right to lock the firearm. Now when the bolt, again, I'm trying to do this at a very weird angle, when the bolt goes to the rear, try and hold that back for you guys, you see that that, that nut turns to the left when it slams home, it locks to the right, um, thus locking the bolt and the barrel. So the barrel is attached here through a set of lugs, the bolt is attached here through a set of lugs, and this is really your chamber area inside this furniture nut. When you fire, of course, it goes into recoil, and as long as your finger is held, it allows the uh, firing pin to go home and fire uh, once the bolt closes and the breech is locked. Close that up. Now, if I want to open and lock the bolt, which I'm going to do again, again, I know I'm a little bit off camera, you do that by retracting the bolt and then pushing, I'm gonna zoom back out a little bit here, pushing on this flat portion of the charging handle here that allows the bolt to stay locked to the back. You need to do that to replace your barrel. There is a lever on this side, which you will pull out and swing it down. That will allow the barrel to turn left, unlocking it from the furniture nut and to come out. And you can see this series of sort of locking wedges here on the barrel, which when turned into position, will lock it into that nut. Now your sights up here at the front are fixed as mentioned, so as you replace your barrels, your zero is obviously going to be affected by that. Not the best design. And here at the back, sights are fixed as well, and you could turn this up if you want to make more fine adjustments on the rear end. Here is the safety on this side. You turn it down into safe, and up is off safe, and you do have a shoulder rest right here, the little shoulder thing that goes up, of course, which makes it a real military firearm. Okay, the disassembly is pretty easy. We'll come up here to the front and start by removing the barrel, which we've already showed you. So we'll move that lever down, twist, and it'll come out. And you wanna bring it out from the front. Set that aside. And moving here to the rear, there is a series of little locking wings here in the back. You wanna make sure that the bolt is in the closed position, but I make sure the firing pin is locked to the rear, which I've already done. So you start by pulling on these two tabs here on the back. That will allow this rear butt plate, uh, rear receiver cap and pistol grip assembly to rotate off and back. You just drop the firing pin. That will allow the bolt components See, that's the bolt, recoil spring, and everything to drop right out the back. There is the firing pin, and there is a very large bolt. Here's the internal as well. The ejector is right here. And yeah, that's basically it. Now you could take out this furniture nut and little H block. I'm not gonna mess with that right now, but we'll look at this component here. Here is a rather large recoil spring buffer buffer spring now taking a look at the rear receiver section right here on the back you can see there is a little it's almost like a little uh what i want to say a wedge that's here inside this groove that when i pull the trigger it drops down out of the way that's the only function of the trigger that's happening if i move the gun to safe it literally just prevents me from pulling the trigger it blocks the trigger not allowing that little wedge inside there to drop now, the purpose for that is if I reassemble this, put the buffer spring back in the buffer, recoil spring, and I'm sorry, the uh, firing pin spring and firing pin, pop that back in there. That is now ha held by that little wedge you saw that I was just showing you move. So when I pull the trigger, that moves the wedge out of the way, allowing the firing pin to then travel through the bolt, which is hollow on the inside with a track up here at the top, and then hitting the 
uh, the face of the primer, allowing the firearm to, to discharge firing the round. Of course, the bolt has its own independent recoil spring. Now, as long as I am pulling the trigger, that will allow the firing pin to travel back and forth freely with the bolt. After it goes forward with the bolt, once it's fully locked in a battery, the firearm will fire. The, the firing pin will go into recoil with the bolt. As long as I'm holding the trigger, the firing cycle will continue until I'm out of ammo, in which case it'll just stay forward with the bolt or if I let off the trigger. If I let off the trigger, it stays locked to the rear, but the bolt will continue under its own independent recoil spring back into battery, will lock into the uh, to the fermature nut with the barrel, thus having chambered around off the magazine, and it's ready for another round. So if you want to fire in bursts or try and get single shots, anything like that, that is essentially how it works. So the firing pin has its own, I guess you would call it a sear, uh, which when you pull the trigger allows the reciprocating nature of the firearm. It's funny because a lot of semi-automatic conversion closed bolt machine guns work under this exact same principle. Okay, it's like with their own slam fire firing pin. Firing pins uh, typically house inside the bolt, but they have a second slam fire mechanism that's actuated by the trigger group rather than the entire bolt being locked to the, to the rear, which is typically what you see on an open bolt machine gun. So as you can imagine, this was a very difficult and time consuming machine gun to manufacture. The amount of machining that was required to build this was pretty substantial. They were slow to build and also very expensive. If we look at it, you know, just having it here on the table today, looking at it as a historical piece, uh, it does paint an interesting time in Italian small arms development. That's why I'm really happy to be able to take a look at it. And I actually find this incredibly interesting and I'm really happy I have a chance to show it to you guys here. Uh, on our website, webuyguns.com, we do purchase machine guns. So if you have anything like this, I'd be more than happy to take a look. Uh, I'm gonna leave you guys off with those thoughts. If you have any questions, please leave those down below in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know by hitting the like button. Also consider subscribing as uh, we do post content like this pretty regularly and hit that bell notification button. I'm gonna leave you guys off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and webuyguns.com in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV and I will see you next time.